Hello, this is Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. Welcome to my presentation on Extremity CTA. Before discussing uh, issues around accuracy and interpretive errors, I like to put everything in context with a description of VRAD's quality assurance system and where we lie relative to other published quality assurance data. So over its 20 years of existence, VRAD has been overread to an extraordinary percentage, mainly due to the predominance of preliminary interpretations in our study mix. So over all these years, you can see this purple line at the bottom is actually our QA rate over time in major misses per 1,000 studies. And that, over 20 years, has averaged about 1.3 major misses per 1,000 studies. Now, to compare that to other literature, the Wilson-Wong study is probably the largest and the most relevant study out there in that it was applied to overnight teleradiology, uh, which is the main uh, center of focus for VRADS cases as well. That brought things in at over five major misses per thousand studies, uh, more than three times the QA rate we see at VRAD. Other published literature include the SAFA study, which was from Dallas. That was a smaller study of only 700 patients, and they were trauma patients. So, of course, there were many more findings and therefore many more misses, and that ranked as high as 30 major misses per thousand. And then lastly, the other oft-cited publication in the QA literature is the Wu meta-analysis. And any statistician will tell you that meta-analysis is just another word for garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> but anyway, that one brought things in at under 25 major misses per thousand. So VRAD stands in, in very good shape in relation to published literature. And I believe this is a legitimate, true difference uh, it, and it's related to the exposure to overreading that we have at Virtual Radiologic, which has imbued us all with a culture, I think, of extreme quality. We categorize every QA we receive by both pathology and anatomic region. So we have stats now going back over three years. And this particular chart is 2019 through 2021 inclusive. So I'll give you the punchline right away. The most frequently missed entity is the pulmonary embolism. And that's, again, three years worth of data. So second is the spine fracture, with fracture coming in as the largest class of pathologies that are missed. And then third place is the intracranial hemorrhage. So we use this information to choose the algorithms we use for artificial intelligence, and also to choose the curricular topics that we address in our CME presentations. So why are we doing extremity CTA? Well, the other input we have in determining these things is medical malpractice. I did a review of 45 medical malpractice cases that closed over a period of four years. Those cases spanned about nine years in total, but they closed over a four-year period with an indemnity, meaning either a jury award or a settlement payment. So of those 45 cases, there were 35, so seven ninths, that I found were exclusively, specifically related to a diagnostic error by the radiologist. There were other factors in the other 10 cases, but there's no question in my mind that 35 cases were avoidable and were exclusively related to a diagnostic error. So here are the pathologies and how they were represented. And as you can see, epidural abscess, aortic dissection, and ischemic bowel certainly are very important, the most important things. And that's what our algorithm development and CME have been focused on in the last few years. But note as well, popliteal abnormalities amounted to more than a million dollars in indemnities, two out of the 35 cases. So around 6% of avoidable errors were actually on extremity CTAs. So with that, we will get into our extremity CTA cases.
We'll start with a relatively straightforward case of a subclavian AV fistula. You can see it here, a broad contrast communication between the posterior subclavian artery and the anterior subclavian vein. Note there is a diminution of flow in the subclavian artery beyond the point of the fistula, and there is, of course, an augmentation of the venous return in the subclavian vein. Here we have it on the cine. You can see this was a penetrating trauma. You can see the soft tissue changes, the subcutaneous stranding, and the skin thickening and laceration overlying the region. We'll look at the fistula one more time here. Note again the diminution of distal arterial flow and the augmentation of venous return. So that is a subclavian arteriovenous fistula. Our next case is a subclavian artery laceration, one that beautifully demonstrates the collateral flow and reconstitution of the brachial artery around the pectoral girdle in the case of axillary trauma. This again was a penetrating trauma to the axillary region. You can see here this abrupt cessation of the subclavian arterial contrast column. More inferiorly, you can see the brachial artery being reconstituted by the circumflex scapular and subscapular arteries, those communicating with the suprascapular artery on the dorsal aspect of the scapula. On the cine, you can see the retroclavicular suprascapular artery that ultimately will be meeting up with the lower vessels. There is the cessation of the subclavian arterial contrast column. And then inferiorly, the brachial artery being reconstituted by the circumflex scapular and subscapular arteries. So a great example of that collateral pathway. Suprascapular, subclavian, and brachial. All right, a subclavian artery laceration with collateral flow and reconstitution. We'll move to the lower extremities now for the remainder of our cases. This is a stab wound that resulted in soft tissue gas and stranding, as you can see here. There is a laceration of the femoral artery, which is absent at this level. I've come to just use the phrase laceration slash dissection, as with the vast majority of lacerations, there's always going to be some component of dissection associated as well. More inferiorly, you can see the reconstitution of the popliteal artery. Here it is on 3D, that absent segment with distal reconstitution. On the cine, follow that femoral artery. You can see it disappears here in the region of soft tissue trauma. And then we have the reconstitution of the popliteal artery. That proximal portion where it's so narrowed, that could represent a dissection. It could also represent retrograde flow from the point of more distal reconstitution. This is the segment I'm speaking of right there thin, narrowed segment immediately proximal to the reconstituted vessel. And there it is on 3D. Again, that intervening absent segment of the contrast column with distal reconstitution. That is a femoral artery laceration slash dissection. Our next case is a femoral artery laceration with extravasation and distal dissections. Now this is a gunshot wound. You can tell that by the extent of the soft tissue changes. There's a great deal of swelling and there's gas throughout. Here's this small focus of extravasation. Now could that be a pseudoaneurysm? Of course it could be. But in the setting of this much hemorrhage throughout those soft tissues immediately adjacent, 
I will typically err on the side of extravasation. Uh, whereas when the associated hemorrhage is circumscribed and of lesser degree, that's when I'll probably lean more towards pseudoaneurysm. So with this gunshot wound, there was severe stretch injury to the femoral artery as well as that laceration. And that resulted in these two linear dissections, these linear filling defects, one here and one lower down right here. You can also see here in the distal popliteal vessel, there is significant soft tissue stranding surrounding that vessel in the popliteal fat and that is associated with this injury. So two areas of focal dissection related to the stretching of this vessel because there was a great deal of kinetic energy uh, coming through the soft tissues right past that femoral artery. So there's one dissection and distally note again the stranding right there and the linear filling defect. Let's look one more time at that focus of extravasation. Could it be a pseudoaneurysm? Yes, uh, but there is such extensive hemorrhage throughout the soft tissues, I, I would lean more towards extravasation here. And there's that distal dissection. So that is a focus of femoral artery laceration and extravasation with associated distal dissections. Our next case is a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm and AV fistula. So you can see the AV fistula here manifesting as early venous return in the femoral vein. Note also there is extensive subcutaneous edema and just generalized soft tissue edema throughout the left thigh compared to the right. Typically you get such excessive uh, hypercirculation with these uh, AV fistulae that you do get asymmetry uh, due to soft tissue edema. So there is the edema, and that specifically is involving the sartorius uh, muscle, which was the focus of injury here. So here is the pseudoaneurysm. Note the surrounding hemorrhage or hypodensity is well circumscribed and lesser in degree. So that's why I would uh, tend to call this one a pseudoaneurysm rather than a focus of extravasation. Note also at this level, you can see the communication between the femoral artery and vein, with the vein being significantly larger than its counterpart in the opposite leg. Sorry, opposite thigh. Here it is on 3D. You can see the pseudoaneurysm here, but in addition, note that early venous return. And that venous return is not coming from the edge of the image set, as is the normal venous return on the opposite side. That's something my old attending used to call the tube and a half sign. And it's very helpful here, and it's particularly notable on 3D images. So here's that early venous return, the focal pseudoaneurysm here with a well-circumscribed hypodense rim, and that AV communication, some retrograde flow in the femoral vein below the level of the AV communication due to the arterialization of the vein. So there's the pseudoaneurysm and the AV communication, and then that retrograde venous flow there. Here it is on 3D, again the pseudoaneurysm, but note that tube and a half sign, the venous return in the affected femoral vein it's not extending to the edge of the imaged volume. And that tells you it's coming from an AV fistula. So that is a case of a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm with resultant AV fistula.